Hello, everybody. Welcome to the third webinar in our pro series. Uh, sorry, this is a Friday night, not a Monday night. As usual, I'm, I'm sure it's thrown some people off. So thank you for joining us. Um, so with us this evening, it's the same four, myself and Jules, joined by our great friends. Everyone. And uh, colleagues, Graham and Alex. Hello, Graham and Alex. Hi there. Hey, guys. Just to refresh your memory, Alex, osteopath, uh, GB international 400 meter runner. There he is in 1994, running 46 seconds in the Commonwealth Games. That's him second in line there. Um, and uh, Alex is co-founder of Beyond Health in Fulham. And then the other side of the fence, we have uh, elite physio, Graham Anderson. Um, and... Uh, and, and, and Graham is co-founder of Balance Physio in um, Clapham and, and now works on his own uh, and is uh, well known for being a, a tennis physio. Is that right, Graham? Yeah, ATP and Wimbledon, yeah. ATP and Wimbledon, yeah. Um, so that's the four, that's the panel. Um, and I just wanted to mention how we've worked alongside Graham and Alex for many years, uh, in fact, uh, uh, with Graham a couple of decades and with Alex probably 15, 16 years now. And even when we were working in with the Trek team, uh, we would often sidebar in uh, Alex and Graham and we didn't know what was going on. Um, we would often kind of just send a little cheeky video or clip or still or conundrum or problem to um, Graham and Alex just to reference what their views were. That's, 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 the, that's how highly we view their advice. And I think it's true to say, Jill, that we've learned more from Alex and Graham in the time that we've been running Cycle Fit from anybody else, I would say. Do you think that's true? I think so, yeah, definitely. Yeah. They're definitely in tune with what we do. Yeah. And um, you don't feel like you need to own the fit uh, when you work with these two because, you know, there's only so much we can do at our end. But if you can combine everything else, it works really well. Yeah. So it's uh, it's been amazing to have work alongside them for so long and be uh, and have them as part of our brain trust and um, certainly we've learned so much from both of them. So this is a clip that we received in 2015. Rider we were working with, I won't mention who it is, uh, and there were some issues there just coming up to the Tour de France. Um, and um, I think Jules, you sent this clip off to them um, and just to get their feedback. So we're going to play the clip now. Won't identify the rider. Um, and there was, do you want to just talk us through what the issues were, Jules? Um, it was mainly uh, back pain uh, across the lower back. And it sort of built up over the season. And this was two weeks before the Tour de France, I think 2015. And this, this rider had, um, he was up in Sierra Nevada at a training camp. So he couldn't come down because he was altitude training before the tour. But he had excruciating back pain. So he, he got his um, trainer to send us videos see if we could come up with a solution. Um, and Graham, that's that's what you texted back to Jules in 2015 about this rider. Do you want to take us through some of that? Yeah, well, I mean, quite quite, quite a common pattern we see, really. Uh, he seemed like he wasn't wasn't uh, flexing his lower back, his lumbar spine, uh, kind of bending over to the right-hand side. And quite often, if the thoracic, thoracic lumbar, and I was the junction between the thorax and the lumbar, if that's stiff, then there tends to be an overdominance of movement or hinging at one area of the back. And where you hinge is where you get pain and where you stay stiff just remains kind of lazy. Yeah. And quite often you then either hinge with excessive side bend or rotation at that point. And that's the bit where you usually get pain. And that's what we're seeing here is kind of dropping off to one side, and bending to one side. If you want to go back to it. I do. Yeah, oh. I'll go back to it. And 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 um, Alex, I remember you said pretty much the same thing. We've lost your thread, unfortunately, but you you concurred, as I remember, at, at the time. Yeah, no, absolutely. You know, you can see where he's kind of pivoting in his lumbar spine. Um, and then you're sort of looking at, you know, what's what's driving that from above? And obviously, because his hands are fixed, if he's got, if his, there's no sort of um, escape vector for his for his back to get away from. So he's just overloading through that one segment. And then that's what's going to be driving his pain. So yeah, exactly the same thing. So if we were thinking about the the, the topic tonight is um, tuning the engine, strengthening the chassis, what would you what would you guys be doing with him? 
I'd be, first of all, mobilising where he's stiff so he has a choice of segments to move from rather than just hinge at one place um, and then probably work on some, some core work, some potential glute work. Uh, and I think Alex is going to talk about that a bit later as well. Um, so I'm sure he would do the same. What else would you do, Alex? Yeah, I mean, it was that to mobilize, mobilize the stiff bit to basically offload the overloaded segment. Um, and then he's got to improve his movement control through that segment because the body's going to take the path of least resistance. So if he wants to do all his movement through there, he's, he's got to kind of train to, to control that a little bit better. And mobility where he hasn't got it and, and strength where he needs it. Um, that's, it, you know, it, it's not rocket science. It's, it's a simple combination of the two. It, it's rocket science to us, though, Alex. Oh, I think you're selling yourself short there, Phil. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, so that, just an example of how we of how we work with um, Alex and Graham, and often, if when we can, work with them together, both with clients and also in this instance with a, with a elite athlete. So just to um, introduce the topic for this evening, uh, strength in the chassis. Uh, lovely little quote there from Graham, without preparation, the body usually fails, which is a, a nice context for what we're going to talk about. So we're going to start with um, uh, a little presentation from Graham, then we're going to go into a little presentation from Alex, and then we're going to bring it back at the end with some, with some top tips and a conclusion. Uh, before we do, um, lovely little comment from last week, this person may even be on the webinar, um, so with respect to the Pedal, Pedal Like a Pro um, webinar last week, hi there, I just wanted to thank you for your Pedal Upstroke Myth article. I've had terrible hip back pain. Your help, but it's due to trying to drive through the full 360 degrees, uh, which is lovely to hear. Um, so thank you for sending that in. Uh, and also before we just the webinar started, we were all just talking amongst ourselves. Three people uh, on this uh, on this webinar panel have been pedaling without clipping in this week. Um, me accidentally, Jules and Alex by design. Oh, in fact, as well as you, Graham. I think all four of us are pedaling now, not yeah. clipped in. Mm. Yeah, so we're practicing what we preach. Yes, I yeah. just had my basket fitted to my handlebars. Everything's going very well. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I'm going to stop sharing my screen. Graham, are you ready to set the context for us and with your with your presentation? Sure. Okay. So yeah, there's just so, the stuff that uh, Phil was just talking about there. That's obviously more osteopathy, physiotherapy. So that's rehabilitation involvement. Um, uh, the topics are more strength and conditioning. So that's more the preventative stuff throughout the year but obviously the two th two things go hand in hand which is why Alex and myself both work very closely with SNC specialists movement specialists so that sort of thing yeah but out there there's so many training programs and uh, it's the same with runners and marathon running and stuff like that there's so many programs to go depending on what time you want to get through the marathon or depending what goals you want to get with your with your strength and stuff it's an absolute nightmare and, and really, um, this is just one example here, which is uh, Rich Cycling from, from, their, from their magazine. But um, again, you know, it it's, has to really be bespoke to you. That's my big take home message. That uh, if you just take on a program that someone else has suggested, um, it's not necessarily going to be the right thing for you. Because as you can see from that cyclist, there's a lot of things we can go completely wrong. So there's a massive amount of choices of what type of strength and conditioning you can actually do. Yeah. Um, I mean, our image of what strength and conditioning is can be any of these, yeah. Uh, but it can be just simple, very, um, very gentle stuff that's very, very accurate, very bespoke to you as well. Personally, I like treating with a bit of this, a bit of chaos, because especially with cyclists, because cyclists don't really get enough chaos when they're on their bike, um, and so to. And so when the, the few occasions when you do get chaos, you need to have a body that can then adapt to it. Um, triathletes, the same thing. Everything's all very much in line. Um, so you, you run in line, you cycle in line, you swim in line. There's not a lot of rotational work. And so I think in your strength and conditioning, the one thing I'd really add to most cyclists training would be adding some rotational stuff. Add in some rot some torque, add in some deceleration and acceleration of rotation. Yeah, and that's not just sprints. 
that's learning to learning to stop with with your with your limbs um, on and off the bike. Um, so variation is also a good idea. Don't just cycle and cycle harder on your turbo as part of training, and then do some heavy weights and then go back on your bike again. That's just really not enough variation. Yeah. So mix it up. Play a bit of golf. Play a bit of five star football. You know, mix it up. It gives you some some different ideas to your body. And the one thing you're really, really trying to get, I would suggest, is resilience. So resilience is your bounce back ability. Yeah. So you you your um, so you don't keep coming to see people like myself and Alex and being broken down all the time. You don't keep blaming the bike and going to see Julian and Phil to get a bike fit and just get a one millimeter change on something because you can't adapt to it because you're not resilient enough. Yeah. yeah become resilient, become stronger, and you'll end up uh, definitely adapting your strength and conditioning. I'm not going to talk about any strength and conditioning programs as such. I think Alex is going to talk about uh, a few ideas, which is which we just we're full of ideas. But as I say, the take home message is try to become resilient and be bespoke. Um, I'm go- I think Phil might go through this again, but really looking for variation. We need just inline and static uh, stuff. Be bespoke. And I feel don't strengthen your stiffness. Get Try and get mobility first. Work on resistance and resilience, not just your strength, but don't rush it as well. I think people are too quick to go quite heavy, quite quickly. Build it, build it, build it slowly. Get the mobility first. Build the weights up and up and up, same way as you wouldn't run a whole marathon uh, distance in your first few weeks training to run a marathon, you build it up. And don't listen to somebody who doesn't really know what they're talking about and listen to them because they're a mate of yours. And if they're doing it, therefore you should be doing it. I hear that so many times. That's really a big problem. Uh, oh, yeah, sorry. Okay, so over to you. Can I ask you a question, Greg, before we go forward? Yes. So, the chaos thing is a, is, a, was, is a really striking concept. And I remember when I was in my uh, rehab from my last surgery, you were really, you guided me on this when I was started walking and then you, and then you said, no, we need some chaos there. And then you said, and then you told me to deviate off the track and walk off r- on rough ground. And, you know, I gradually just introduced more chaos and that chaos theory has really stuck with me. And I'm not sure that it's, it's common language or parlance, but, yeah, chaos sounds a little bit more aggressive than what I'm actually meaning. I'm just meaning almost like perturbation, some sort of variation. So I imagine you're, you're riding on some cobblestone. Your body's taking a lot of different force to just riding on a nice, maybe really farmax road, yeah? Um, so it could be as simple as that. But but also the, 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 the chaos is as well. As well. If, you're, if you're fighting against headwinds, you're fighting against other, other things, you need to be further ahead on the bike, you know, not quite riding like Cavendish with your nose mile ahead, but... But if you're actually trying to get out of the saddle and be there, you need to be resilient in that position as well. So you need to learn to be uh, to be in different postures and you need to have chaos in those postures that you can manage to hold that posture. So you can always get back to where you feel comfortable, no matter what's thrown at you. I think that's what I mean by chaos. Yeah, it's a lovely concept. And, and, and of course, when you're if someone's doing too much work on indoors on a turbo trainer, just trying to hit high numbers, there's just no chaos there, is there? I mean, or, or there's very little chaos there? No, in fact, there's probably a lot of poor technique as they get fatigued, yeah. Okay, so should we go forward? Alex, are you ready to take over with your programmes? I am indeed. Let me just um, hit this. And... Right, there I am, I think. Okay. Well, so... <clears throat> I thought I'd just sort of start with, a, you know, I love a bit of research. Um, so I thought I'd just start with, you know, why we should actually be doing something off the bike from a strength point of view anyway. And there's quite a lot of good data out there to show that if you do some strength training, it will improve your cycling performance. Um, and this is, you know, this is unequivocal. This was a study back in 2014. Heavy strength training leads to an improved cycling performance in elite athletes. Another one, this was actually in 2015. Um, The most compelling evidence of an additive effect on cycling performance is when heavy strength training is used. And this was like a a meta-analysis of lots and lots of pieces of research. So, you know, we should really be doing something off the bike. And again, just so we have that variation from just kind of being locked into that sort of one vector. 
Um, we're all a bit sort of time strapped and stressed. So again, there's been some research into how much should we be doing? Um, what's going to give us the best return? So what is the minimal dose? Um, and again, what the, the research says is for, for an untrained person, it's probably three days a week. For a trained person, it's two. Um, and this is in terms of sort of strength development. For an untrained person, you're kind of working at around 60% of one rep max. For a trained person, it's going to be closer to 80%. So again, just thinking about one session a week is probably not going to cut it in terms of making a difference. Um, and you're going to have to plan how you put that into your weekly schedule um, because you can't just add another thing in. Something kind of has to, to cut. Um, this is the, the sort of the slide that I kind of always get asked about. Um, <clears throat> and the one line that we're sort of probably particularly interested about in sort of this context is this sort of strength one here. So sort of novice, intermediate levels, you're looking at working at about sort of 60 to 85% of your one rep max. You're doing sort of one to three sets of sort of four to eight reps. If you're a higher level and you're used to, to weight training, then, you know, in terms of your one rep max, you're up between 80 to 100%, um, probably sort of two to six sets, but probably slightly less reps, probably only one to six reps. And again, the other thing that's kind of important is, is thinking about the sort of the recovery between these sets as well. Because, you know, if you sort of do a set and sort of sit there for 10 minutes, you're, you're not going to get the same sort of strength benefit. But I kind of put this slide up there so that, again, you can kind of go back and look at it and sort of think about the things that you, you want to bring in or the areas that you want to bring in. Because, again, <clears throat> Graham and I will be sort of seeing people that are injured and recovering. And while you want to do strength, we might actually need to do some hypertrophy first. So we might actually need to build muscle before we're actually trying to go to strengthening. Because if, there, if there's nothing there to work with, you can't strengthen it. So this is a sort of a movable feast based on what you're trying to achieve. Um, and the other thing is, you know, in a, in a training block, you know, pick one that you want to work on. You can't do everything all the time. So it's also sort of prioritizing where your deficiencies are and, and what you need to um, improve and how you're gonna go about doing that. Um, and there's lots of other ways, you know, the percentage of one rep max is probably the easiest thing to get people's head around. It's sometimes a bit, particularly at the moment, it's difficult to kind of get a sense of what, where you're gonna do that. Um, you can also kind of Google things like um, reps in reserve to kind of give you a sense of how hard you should be working. From a training point of view, again, you know, we sort of look at this model of sort of super compensation. So you train, you then sort of overload the system. So you're going into deficit, the body then overall super compensates. And then if you don't do anything else, it kind of drops down. And depending on how hard you train is obviously going to vary the level of super compensation that you get and the, the level of um, response from the body. From a training point of view, what we want to do is is either kind of those top two set, top two sort of versions. So you train, you recover up to the point of super compensation, then you train again and sort of so on and so forth, so that you're gradually increasing your level of ability. Or you kind of do it in sort of a, a big blocks so that you get a, a, a big increase. What you've got to be careful of, and again, these are the people that end up at my door and at Graham's door are you're not allowing sufficient recovery before you're just sort of hitting the system again. So you're just going to get this sort of non-functioning, overreaching and, and performance decline or, or tissue breakdown. Um, or the other variation is actually you're either allowing too long between training sessions or actually what you do is you don't actually stress the system enough to, to generate super compensation. You actually, to, to affect a training load, you have to actually stress the body. So there has to be appropriate stress. There has to be progressive loading because just doing the same thing over and over again, you will adapt to it, at which point you're no longer progressing. Um, and you have to think about the amount of volume that you're doing. Um, the thing that's probably, you know, where you can make changes is kind of in, is in this sort of section here when you look at recovery protocols and how you can enhance recovery to make 
and that a little bit shorter so that you can get more training in. So sort of, you know, um, recovery protocols are kind of the, the new black in terms of trying to, to, to improve things. Um, so again, recovery is key. And again, the, the, where people fall down is, is the eye tend to see is, is you're pushing strength or, or training loads, you're working too hard, and then you're not giving yourself enough time to recover from those training loads. And I come from a sort of a, a track sprinting background. So most of my training would have been in the sort of the large to extreme levels there. Um, and, you know, if you try and push those margins, you invariably break down um, with injuries. Um, and I have that T-shirt um, in several sizes um, and colours. Um, <clears throat> that said, um, and again, I'd just like to sort of reiterate the point that sort of Graham made, just sort of taking an, an off-the-shelf training programme and kind of going, that's what I'm going to do doesn't work everyone is different um, you need to identify where your deficits are whether it's in your strength and your mobility your motor control your balance um, combinations of all of those and and then to sort of work on on targeted exercises what we do uh, in the clinic at beyond health is you know typically someone will come in with a problem or, or pain more importantly and you know step one is to kind of get them outside of that pain so the exercises are targeted at those deficiencies um, and then once you're pain free it's like okay yes you're pain free but you're not necessarily um, able to to go out and ride a hundred miles that day so you've then got to go progressing through those stages all the way back up and and usually sort of people's recovery and rehabilitation kind of drops off before they get into that performance phase. So we kind of look at it, we, you know, we, we almost sort of separate that into um, let's sort of manage the, the sort of the tissue injury. And now actually we do, we do strength and conditioning. You know, we have strength and conditioning specialist physiotherapists that do the SNC programs and, and we do SNC classes because we're finding that people need that side of things. It's not just enough to kind of get you out of pain. Um, having said not to do off the shelf exercises, I'm now going to, you know, because I'm pretty sure that what people are going to go, so what exercises do you do? Um, I've kind of just going to work through four or five basic exercises um, that are sort of generic for what we need as a cyclist. And again, they're pretty simple and straightforward exercises. Um, we've probably all YouTubed Sagan doing his S&C uh, and some of the crazy things that he can do. You know, I don't need to do a single leg Romanian deadlift on a BOSU with a blindfold on and a 100 kilo bar. Um, you know, it might be nice to do, but it's not what I need. You know, do the basics well first so just look at your strength so basic squat exercise you know squat goblet squat i've got a sort of a little bit of a support underneath my heels um, so it allows me to work um, into a into a fuller range um, so i can work in a range with hamstrings and glutes thinking about or keeping my trunk tall good weight distribution between my feet um, I'm keeping my ribs down so I'm kind of not sort of flaring um, and I keep my weight through my midfoot and drive through that to stand up and then if I do the same thing with a little bit of weight actually a little bit of weight makes it easier to do you can kind of see my you know what I wanted to emphasize is sort of the posture point so I'm going full range I'm not kind of just going sort of half range I want to work through all those points I'm going to need that level of hip flexion on the bike um, I want to load through my glutes, I want to load through my hamstrings. And, you know, it's a great exercise because it's going to target everything. If I'm looking at strength, then I'm going to need to obviously add more weight than that. But I think the other key thing is make sure you can do the technique well before you start loading yourself up, because otherwise you're just going to break yourself um, and you're not going to get the gains in the right place. Um, from there, uh, so Romanian deadlift, and again, we were talking a couple of couple of webinars about about sort of the aero position 
So you need that extensibility through your posterior chain. So, you know, it's a small knee bend, but you can see, you know, we use sort of the broomstick or, or some sort of a pole. So you have that sort of little bit of feedback in terms of going to go, okay, there's my, um, my pelvis, my lower back, my spine, my head up against that pole, my hips sort of sink back as I kind of go through and do that. And again, until someone can do this, we're not loading them up with, with weight really to begin with. I, you know, we just make sure that their patterning is correct first, but it's a brilliant exercise um, for what we want to be able to do. Um, again, now if I do it with weight, um, what I wanted to use this um, slide to show, so it's just exactly the same exercise, but if you haven't got access to lots of weight, one of the things you can do to change the intensity is to vary the tempo. So normally we do sort of a, a two to three seconds down, one second up, and the lowering movement is the, is the harder, tougher movement, but you can make this exercise harder by going down slower. So you're really biasing sort of the eccentric component and then driving up for the concentric phase. So you, instead of sort of doing two to three seconds down, one second up, you're doing sort of three to five seconds down, one second up. So that's gonna make it harder. So again, there's, there's lots of modifications and ways you can kind of add to these exercises. Um, <clears throat> moving on, uh, other favorite, uh, Bulgarian squat. So again, uh, particularly it's gonna target quads and glutes, back leg, you're gonna get that eccentric loading through your quadriceps. So loading and lengthening or, or loading under lengthening, depending on how you sort of add and position weight. Again, sort of key points, um, <clears throat> um, create length through your lower back so you're not kind of collapsing. Um, don't push into the toes, keep the chest, to uh, chest tall. Um, I should have started playing that as I'm doing that. Um, drop down to you feel sort of the load stretch through the back leg. And again, you can kind of play with the timing. So slowly down, drive back up. And obviously you can add weight to that. Um, you can add weight in one arm to that. So again, I like sort of, um, split stance stuff, so you have a little bit of a, a balance challenge. So it's it's introducing a tiny bit of chaos, as opposed to just kind of doing squat based exercises. Can I ask you a question, Graham? Uh, Alex, sorry. Yes, of course. Do you, uh, when you do this exercise, do you is everything done from the the front leg, or do you no. contribute from the back as well? So you can bias it either way. So if you push it more to the front leg, you're going to get more through that front quad glute. Yeah. If you bias it through your back leg, you're getting a lot of eccentric drive through that that back um, quadricep. Um, so again, you kind of kind of play with the two. I, you know, when I'm doing it personally, I'm kind of centered somewhere between the two. Mm -hmm. um, but usually, as a you know, as I'm doing more and more cycling, my anterior chain is getting tighter. So, so if I go back to sort of the slide before and looking at the Romanian deadlift and thinking about getting that length. Yeah through my posterior chain and i'm using the length under load to kind of create that with this one i'm kind of creating length under load through my anterior chain through that back leg so it's kind of the sort of the counter exercise for that if that makes sense yep very good can i can i, can I ask a question alex yes of course can you define uh, eccentric and concentric yes um, I, I realised saying that that I should probably have gone there. So when you can, oh, let me do it with the bicep. So when you, um, so my bicep here, as I lower my arm and as I raise it up again, in both instances, it's my bicep doing the work. It's my bicep contracting. As I raise my arm up, the two ends of my bicep are coming together, so the muscle is shortening. That's what's called a concentric contraction. So it's like a, a, a pull. As I lower my arm down, this time the two ends of my bicep are actually lengthening, but I'm still, there's still low, there's still contraction with my 
um, bicep muscle. So it's, it's almost, it's like a braking action as I'm slowly lowering it down. That's what's called an eccentric contraction. You can generate more force with an eccentric contraction, but it's much higher load on the muscle because you're basically trying to contract and stretch or lengthen at the same time. And if you want to improve someone's extensibility, that sort of eccentric loading is, is a fantastic and pretty most effective way of doing it. And basically, Bill, just to confuse it all, we often use isometric, which is where you're static in your movement, although you're not static on the bike, obviously, but static in training, just to confuse you. Yeah, so those, those are the three terms in terms of muscle contraction. Uh, concentric, or the two ends are coming together. Um, eccentric, two ends are separating. Isometric, it's staying still. But so all of them involve muscle contraction. What would be an example of an isometric exercise then? Um, I pick up my bike and I just hold it there. So my bicep is now taking the weight of my bike. It's not moving. That's an isometric contraction. Right, I see. Okay. Thank you. We'll use those in rehab, particularly sort of, they, they're great for sort of tendon loading early stages. So that there, there's, you know, there's times when you want to use each one of those sort of different variants. I've got a question, uh, Alex, another one from a viewer. Yes. Um, it looks like um, this person, they've, um, they've only got light weights at home because they're in lockdown. Yes. Uh, but they want to get towards 80% of their one rm yes uh is there anything that they could do to maybe um uh, pre-fatigue the muscles for instance and they um, say i i would first of all i kind of try these eggs these are harder than they look mm -hmm. in the first instance with squats yeah i i, I tend not to pre-fatigue the muscles because then i think often people's technique goes out the window mm -hmm. Um, I, I try to kind of be creative what I do. So, you know, at home, I, you know, I, this is our, you know, we've, we've just moved into new premises and, you know, we've got all the toys to play with in the clinic. I don't have this at home to play with. So I will fill a rucksack with books. I've got one more question from a viewer. Uh, inactive glutes. Yes. Uh, can you, how would you, how would you activate those? Before, would you activate them before doing these exercises or would the exercise activate them? If you're doing the exercises technically well, these are exercises that will load your glutes. Perfect. Um, like Alex said originally, though, if you actually haven't got the muscles there in place, we need to do some some activation first before we actually do these exercises. We want to hmm. include them. So, yeah, so, uh, so, I, so, so there'll be stepping stones if you've got an issue to kind of get it up to this point. So I've kind of, I've also kind of come in with these ex exercises off the back of the um, the aero position webinar as well, which is why I've chosen most of these. Um, but you know, a squat. If you squat, if your pelvis is in the right place doing a squat, you should be engage. You should be um, engaging your glutes. Mm -hmm. But often people's pelvis isn't. You know, if I kind of go back to, uh, let me see if I can flick back. No, I need to go that way. That way. Oops, excuse me a second. Let's well, I guess that's where um, with cycling, if your posture's not right, yeah. you're not, they're not no, far enough. If you're posteriorly tilted on the bike, you can't engage your glutes. Yeah. It's all, you, know, you can see the angle of my pelvis as I'm dropping down because it's kind of tilting slightly forwards. I have to use my glutes to drive back up. You know, and what I might do is I might do holds in that position to really kind of work the glutes, or I might go back and do... Um, uh let's see if i yeah so i might do like a bulgarian squat and actually hold that position or have the back leg on the on the floor and hold that position and your glutes gonna have to work really hard in that i mean mm -hmm. if people really don't have anything i'll start them doing stuff on the floor but I like to get people into a vertical more functional position as quickly as I can and usually you can find something to do I mean what I want to be careful of is there are a gazillion exercises out there and, and that's why it needs to kind of be bespoke for a person because I've got probably sort of half a dozen starting glute exercises and some cues might work for some people and not for others 
So you've got to, you know, the, the part of the, the skill set and experience of what Graham and I do is kind of going for this person, this is going to be the exercise that kind of works for them to get them going. Um, yeah, most, most blue tissues on, on cycling is the fact that, that one side is weaker than the other. Yeah. Wise. So there's not a, an overall glute problem. It's one side more than the other. I mean, usually from a history of back pain or something like that, the nerves from the back have then made the glutes not fire actively. So then you develop patterns by using one glute stronger than the other, which you might see on a power meter. But just by trying to push harder on one side isn't going to be your answer. So that's why you need to do this sort of uh, mm -hmm. bespoke training once, once you realize how to activate your glutes, then you can do these exercises. Sorry, what, why is pushing why isn't so you got so you've got a 4753 on your power meter why is it not effective just to push harder on that side graham As, uh well i mean it will it will make the glutes work harder but there can be a lot of compensatory movements as well which can then like that cyclist we saw earlier you can then hinge in the back if you are then having to move too hard and push through one side yeah so there's there's always potentials of causing other problems by just by just by just doing it that's why mm -hmm. If that's they're why you've got to more resilient first. That's my point. You've got to yeah, forget. If they're pushing hard, no, sorry, Graham. Sorry, cover. No, I was going to say. I mean, if they're pushing hard and they're having to kind of move all over the bike to kind of do that to generate that force, and that's just going to cause problems. Yeah. No, I, I, the thing is, I totally agree with you. I, I just we. I mean, that's what we see with clients when they're 53, 47, and, you know, and they feel like it's a problem. It, it never works just to try and manually go to, or consciously go to 50-50. It's not, it's not a strategy that works. Yeah. yeah. If, I, if I use my example of tennis, I always use the example of tennis. I know it's nothing to do with cycling, but take someone like we all know, Rafa Nadal. Yeah, he, he has an incredibly small comfort zone uh, in his strength and control and strength and conditioning. He shit hot in that strength and conditioning area, but as soon as he goes outside his 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 comfort zone, he breaks down. He's injured quite a lot as a result of it. Yeah, you know he's very much in control in that small comfort zone. So becoming more resilient means widening your comfort zone so that you can adapt and you can build, you can do these things. Yeah? So we want to be very resilient. You want to have as much slack in your system to cope with that sort of thing as is possible. Totally, yeah. I'm not slagging Nadal off, don't by the way. No. Um, right, where did we get to? Oh yeah, so, so the final sort of leggy type exercise that I've kind of thrown in there as well um, is this one. So it's an elevated front squat. And again, the reason I, you know, you, you can do things like a step up. The reason I like this one um, is, is if you're a bit restricted with your traditional squats, you can't get enough depth. Um, or you've got limited hip or ankle movement, then this gives you a nice alternative. And it's, you know, the bars is on that front leg to really work that front leg, glute and um, quad. And again, you know, it's all about the posture. Um, you can um, keep the chest tall, tall as you're dropping down and then you're driving through that front leg to sort of come back up. And again, I'm kind of just repping away there because I'm just kind of trying to demonstrate it. If I was training, I would probably slow the descent down a little bit and then drive back up through the um, through the sort of the, the rise phase. So again, I can I can make it harder kind of doing it that way around. And again, you know, with those back toes up, there's a there's an element of balance challenge in there that make all of these a lot harder than you might otherwise think they are. Um, and those are kind of the only you know those are kind of the if I had to pick my sort of four exercises to do, though from a, from a sort of a leg cycling generic point of view, I'd probably start with those. Others are available. And, and with anyone, we kind of sort of tweak them as, as needed. From there, I just kind of wanted to throw in a few other sort of, you know, stuff that I think about doing for the core. So again, I kind of like stuff where I'm working in a position where the hips are flexed. So I have a little sort of stretch out, sort of cat and cow. And then I come into a hover. So I kind of I find a neutral position and then I just float up. Um, at this point, the physio said, now touch one hand to one elbow, at which point I thought they're having a laugh because um, that was actually much harder than I was expecting it to. <laughs> um, so I then had to go to the, the, um, the child's version, which is to do it in this position, which I'm sad to say I still found quite challenging. So again, it's just thinking about that sort of little bit of motion, rotation control, and trying to think about, you know, 
this is the position that my torso arms are going to be in on the bike. So in a lighter position, that should actually be quite easy. Um, variations on sort of the hover, so the ones that I can actually do, are then to drop down and sort of to doing sort of working through what, what we call protraction and retraction. So shoulders coming forwards and backwards. So again, I can I, I could potentially hold at any one of those points. Again, just sort of working control in the positions that I'm going to be in on, on the handlebars. Um, I tend not to like just purely static movements because you know, we, even if I'm doing core stuff, because usually what I'm trying to treat is people are, are, are overly rigid and braced um, because they, they're, they're sort of fixing themselves. And actually, usually it's because they're not strong enough to have the fluidity and adaptability within their system to cope with the loads that they're placing themselves under. Um, variations for a little bit of sort of rotation controls of the sort of classic dead bug exercises. So you can do it just with hands or just with your legs. Um, and then you sort of get a little bit of sort of, again, sort of rotation control where you sort of doing, I had to think opposite arm and leg was there for a second, but opposite arm and leg. Um, the variations I would probably say to what you tend to see on YouTube, YouTube is like, you know, push your lower back flat hard into the ground. Um, I'm actually kind of going, actually, I want you to think, I want you to find the neutralist. So there's just a tiny little bit of a lower back curve and hold in that neutral position. Um, and then we like to do um, a little bit of rotation control. So slightly unstable position. I've got a band pulling me from one side and then just being able to, again, hold still through the core as I've got some sort of sort of like an anti-rotation um, exercise that I'm trying to control. So if I'm getting loaded from one side or the other, I can control that. Um, I can make that a little bit harder by making myself more unstable. So sort of same sort of thing doing small sort of short holds, moving out of it, moving back in. Um, and then that's all I'm gonna kind of do from a, a strength and conditioning point of view. Again, what I wanted to just flag up is sort of the last exercise. Um, so this is Tessa, this is one of our strength and conditioning physios. This is the old clinic, you can see how much nicer the new one is. Um, <clears throat> that we are still tight and I've just gone kind of strength, strength, strength. Um, but we don't want to forget our mobility and you're going to see why I got her to demonstrate this rather than me who's super stiff is that this is a really nice sort of anterior chain mobility little routine that we just kind of like to, to work through as you kind of go through there and again sort of thanks to Tessa for also kind of helping me out with which are the best exercises to do it's wonderful to have a team of experts that we can call on as well um, and um that's me, I think. Um, I don't need to show you that, so I will stop. Where's my mouse got? I will stop sharing. Um, and then I guess comments and questions, guys. Just got one here uh, from a because we're talking about performance. Uh, but this person is a recreational cyclist, and they're wondering whether they should be doing strength and conditioning two to three times a week if they were just recreational or should, I mean, yeah, should they? Well, I'm, I'm, I'm nearly 60. I'm recreational. <laughs> I do do it myself. I think it's a simple answer. If I believe in it, I'll do it myself. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and I am, I am no longer, I, you know, I don't race. I, I ride for pleasure, but yes, I do. Um, because, you know, I, I've had a lot of injuries in my past. I don't want to have any more really. <laughs> Well, it's good. It's good for your general well-being, isn't it? And <coughs> fitness as you get older should be. And, part you know, of it. I see. You know, we see people that just cycle, um, and you know, with any single repetitive exercise, that can start to cause problems. But you know, the other thing I see with with a lot of cyclists um, who aren't necessarily that old is sort of osteoporotic or osteopenic issues, um, and you know, you need to do some other form of diversity and exercise and loading to to counter that as well. Yeah. Yeah, well, I know. I know the question wasn't about age, but it's kind of, kind of matters as well. Though, and as long as you take the same precautions, that you don't just go into it too quickly and get your flexibility first. Certainly, as an older person, I'm having to do a lot more on that side than I am on my strength side. Although you lose your strength much much quicker as you get older, 
I'm also losing a lot of mobility and I'm getting really stiff after rides and that sort of thing if I, if I don't maintain that sort of conditioning. Very good. Um, I've got another one about Zwift racing. Don't know if you know what that is. <clears throat> it's quite painful. Uh, no, it's, it's quite intense. And uh, what guidance on how to prepare as uh, seems like there's lots of knee injuries. I guess that's from people talking to each other on Zwift. It's something they do, Phil. Uh, yeah. I don't know if that's one we should answer. Yes. What's your answer, Philip? Oh, no, you answer it. Well, it, it's, <laughs> well, it says Zwift, Zwift racing. Uh which I don't think is very social because it, it's, it's so intense. It could, it's, it's almost like you're going to die when you do that. So I think um, I think what happens is because you're because uh, you're on that machine and you're locked in, all technique goes out the window because you're just you're just looking at your watts and things. And so I'd say, unless you're in tip top condition, avoid the racing. But for general Zwift riding, I think it would apply that your setup has to be correct and you have to maintain yourself off the off the bike. I think what what I'd want to sort of put out there is you've got you've got seven days in the week, and everybody works on a seven day rotor. So you've got the weekend for your long rides, and you've got slot in your training, your cycling, and your strength and conditioning. How many gaps do you have in between these sessions? Should you work it over a three week schedule, and then maybe rest of the weekend so you can recover for the Monday? Otherwise, because what it seems to be doing, people cycle four or five days a week and then do two days strength and conditioning or that sort of thing. So how much, you, how much would you say rest wise we, we should have? And I'm guessing as you get older, the more you need. So, so you, you have to be sensible with factoring that in and, and then, you know, how many sessions can you realistically do in a week? And then you kind of have to sort of work backwards from there in terms of what is it I really want to be able to do? And then what do I need to do to maintain what I really want to be able to do. And, that, and that's going to be individual to each person. Can, can I ask a question? Yeah. So um, I, I've been I've been rehabbed like you, Mags. I've got the T-shirt, in, injury T-shirt, and I've been rehabbed by both of you several times after all the calamities I've befallen myself. Um, and... You know, I do do a bit of strength and conditioning, but to be honest, I, I'm sort of post strength and conditioning because I've just done so much of it to rehab myself. If I want or a cyclist wants to do an activity or a sport that is not cycling, but that, where they can get most of the strength and conditioning dividend, what would it be? What's the perfect sport to accompany cycling? I don't think there's a, an answer to that because, again, everything needs to be bespoke to the individual. So for Perfect sport for one will be different to someone else. Okay. Um, simple. If, if you think about the, if you think about what the loads that the the, the, the that cycling puts upon the body, is there a, a sport that's an antidote to those loads? Flexed hip, flexed spine, or shouldn't be, but it is. Something more rotational is quite good, like I was talking about before. You know, rather than in line, something a bit more rotational will be useful. Something that moves you around in many different directions in lots of different ways. Yeah. And preferably, you know, with your feet on the ground. But if, but also, if you, if Phil, you're not into strength and conditioning, because that's just a term, an umbrella term, which, let's face it, we're all, we could all argue about what it actually means. Um, for me, it's all about the preparation before you cycle is the is the key, and that doesn't mean five minutes before you go. That means the the other days that you're not cycling, are you actually ready to go to your next cycle? So, it, it could be very simple things. It could be just to getting some Pilates or that type of gentle exercise to just activate your core, activate your glutes or whatever it may be, may be enough to just kind of maintain and steer off the injuries. And that to me is strength and conditioning, you know, because you actually, you prevented it, but it's not your traditional, you know, hypertrophy, building muscle, bulk, weight, weight management, sort of strength and conditioning, uh, looking at V2O max, that sort of, sort of high level physiology stuff. And you know, we can go down all those different avenues. Yeah, and that's why you know, to, to cover a whole of strength and conditioning on a bike, yeah, you know, we should really have a physiologist here. Yeah, but um, yeah, no, it can be very simple. Yeah, and if someone's got plenty of strength and, and they're stiff, then they're, it's the conditioning side of strength and conditioning. It's the, it's, you know, it's the mobility. 
How about um, hypermobile people? How should they approach strength and conditioning? Uh, well, they should definitely be doing it. Um, and they need really good technique and they need to be strong. You know, and it's got to be a progressive build up, but you know, they, they need input. Yeah. And it depends on the individual as well, though, because a lot of hypermobile people don't have any problems. You know, it's uh, so as long as they maintain what they've got, it's not, you know, having that diagnosis of hypermobility, you know, it doesn't necessarily mean it's a problem. Yeah. Same as stiff as a board doesn't necessarily mean it's a problem, but it's, it's better not to be. <laughs> Uh, I've got another question. Do, do either of you know what TSS is? You see it um, on Strava, don't you? Yeah, it's on my it's on my Wahoo computer as the sort of the stress score. I, I personally don't use it, so I can't can't comment on it. Okay, because the question is: Is it a useful measure of stress intensity when planning, training, recovery, etc.? I don't use it either. No, Sorry. I don't. Sorry, Stephen. Don't know the answer to that one. There's a lot of things you could measure. But again, it's the question of why are you trying to measure it? What, what, what is the reason why you want to measure it? What, you know, you could be, yeah. measuring, you could be measuring, measuring your oxygen consumption as you're cycling as well, but why do you want to do that? Mm, I think it's probably just measuring duration, power and heart rate. And yeah, But what, what's the benefit of knowing that information is the question. Yeah? Just, for some people, it's very important. For others, it's really not useful mm. at all. Yeah. Uh, another one is any differences for women strength and conditioning over men anything we should take into account uh yes i mean hormonally yes there is there are issues at certain times but um no i think gen generally again since we've been bespoke about it that's just another bespoke factor yeah yeah the the, the exercises are going to be the same the sets and the reps and the loading is going to be, you know, same sort of percentages. Okay. Yes, yeah, so, I mean, it's just going to be adapted for the individual, isn't it? Yeah. Really, and their fitness level. Just another thing to think about when you're setting your program. Yeah. Yeah. Even if you're pregnant, it's, you have to just think about it a little bit different. It doesn't mean you stop. Here's another, I've got another one. Is there an issue with running and cycling in terms of load? Do the strength and conditioning exercises recommended change? Load from the, the ground forces going up through the body. There's a lot. There's, yeah. going, there's going to be a lot more impact with running than there is with cycling. The road is all, load is also now described most most of these days as the amount of effort and and the time you spent cycling spent spent doing exercise. So you're doing a lot more cycling time wise usually than running. Mm -hmm you're a marathon runner so or even if you are so yeah, i think you that, need to add that type of load is high you need better condition to run though really don't you it's easier if you're not in such good condition it's easier to cycle than it is to run you, you, you need conditioning for running so yeah. you're, you know you're loading your tendons and your tissues in a very different way because of the impact so you need to be conditioned for that you know mm. with, with any exercise you need to be conditioned there's a specificity that you need to be conditioned to and if you're running you know i think running and cycling you know work quite nicely together and give you slightly different things but again if you're doing lots of both you've got to look at that overall training volume as well yeah um, from a strength training point of view you know the loads that you'll be doing on those exercises aren't going to be any different because your one rep max is your one rep max mm. do you still ask run, question? Alex? Sorry. Mm. Yes. So, Sorry, Greg. Who was coming? Can I ask a question? Yeah. So, with with um with the exercise you showed us, Alex, um, what what would that, would that do, have any effect on bone minerality, which is an, an issue for middle aged midlife performance cyclists, where it seems that we're so our bone minerality is can be on the low side. Do any of those exercises increase your your bone mineral scores? Yeah, all of them would, because you're, you know, you're doing, you're doing vertical loading through, through gravity under with, you know, potentially with weight. Um, you know, I would do that, you know, probably I like to get the cyclists and I haven't got a video. No, I haven't got a video of me doing it, of doing like some low level plyometric stuff as well. Um, and and multi-directional plyometric stuff, mainly because it's, it's a bit of a giggle watching them try to do it. Um, particularly if it's in different directions, because we just used to going in one plane and if I kind of say, okay, now go left, right, and then start doing diagonals and, and twisting and turning, it's like, well, that's quite a challenge. Um, but, but, but also because those low level, you know, that's great for sort of bone density stuff as well. 
variation in training. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. No, I get, thank you. Uh, yeah. I get my patients boxing as well for the upper body. Perfect. Really? Yeah, brilliant, brilliant training, multi-directional. No, proper boxing, not just kind of there doing this. But if you do proper boxing training, you're doing the ducking, the weaving, the twisting, the turning, different directions, hitting stuff, very therapeutic emotionally as well, you know, so many pluses. If you think if you think about the kinetic chain, I don't know if you know understand what the kinetic chain is, like from the fingertip to the shoulder is the upper body kinetic chain, from the feet to the up to the back is the lower body kinetic chain. If you have a weak part in that chain. You know, force will always find it. So uh, if you if you're going over rough terrain, or you're 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 taking shock through your arms, and you've got a problem with your upper back, you're going to feel it in that upper back because it's taking shock. Same way. So if you start to learn taking shock by doing things like boxing, you're going to actually educate yourself to learn to take shock. So you both use boxing training in your as love it. Yeah, brilliant. Yeah, actually, if you're if you're going to say you know the one sport you should do. <laughs> My, my, might be towards the top of that list that's my point that's my point so maybe maybe you should be doing boxing classes for cyclists that's what i'm thinking <laughs> while you're on zwift off, off the bike yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> let's have a little punch bag next to you <laughs> excellent i think we're, we're just about approaching the hour now uh okay so, so do you want to yep. just um Okay, so um, this is a case study. This is one of our clients who's kindly allowed us to, to show this. So uh, he's 56 years old uh, and uh, he's been looking at the webinars, uh, I think every week, which is great. Thank you. Uh, and this is his little quote here. Strength training was one of my great rediscoveries this year. Uh, as I was enlisting the services of a cycling coach last weekend, I did a six month test with him. Very happy with touching 1000 watts, VO2 max 60, um, VLMAX, VLX uh, 29, and FTP of 300. And that's a pretty, that's a nice shopping list for somebody who's 56, guys, don't we think? Yeah, it's good. Yeah, very good. Yeah. Uh, happy, you happy with that, Alex? Yeah, I would be happy with that. <laughs> yeah, I would, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay, uh, and then uh, just to end with Graham's top tips, do you want to take us through these again, um, Graham, um, just to summarise where we are? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I think we've Alex and I have hammered this point, really, that, you know, variation, mixing it up is really the best way to be resilient on your bike. Don't just, uh, as I say here, don't just, do pick a, something from Google and a strength and conditioning program that your auntie does just because granny says it's good for her too. I mean, that doesn't necessarily mean it's going to be good for you, you know? So, so yeah. So yes, tune the engine, but only once you've established what's actually the, the problem with the engine, and whether it's actually misfiring or not, fix that in a bespoke manner and then, and then obviously strengthen under the same caution. But the, but, there's, but, the, but the message to take home here is there's something about cycling that means that it's not enough on its own. It, 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 there's something intrinsically about the act of cycling, sitting on a saddle with your hands controlled by the handlebars and your feet controlled by the pedals. It's not enough on its own. Yeah, that's that what true. We're I, think, I think that's true of every sport, isn't it? I mean, you took look at golfers, for example. They used to be just golfers and they didn't do anything else. But now the top golfers do a lot of conditioning. The top cyclists do a lot of conditioning. Top runners do a lot of conditioning, yeah. So, why not the lessers like myself <laughs> do a bit as well? Yeah, okay. All right, with that, um, thank you, gentlemen. Thank you, everybody, for uh, watching along on a Friday evening. Uh, great to have you with us. We're, we're going to try and go back to our Monday night, Jules. Are we for the next one? Yeah, yes, we will. Yeah, yeah, if, if we can, guys. Is, yeah, uh, and then so we'll give it'll be two weeks, two weeks this Monday, won't it? Would be our next one. Yeah, and we'll um, we'll be putting this this webinar up on YouTube, and hopefully uh, with Alex's permission, some of the the exercises as well. So we'll have a reference there. That's that's all right, Alex. Yeah, yeah, that's absolutely fine. Yeah, yeah, all good. Brilliant. Okay, well, thank you guys. Thank right. you very much for watching, and everyone have a lovely weekend. Weather forecast is good. Thanks yeah. very much. Good, good night. night. Bye bye. Take care, all. Thank you.